Ok. Jay Gurdiv, Rishi Jay Gopal. Jay Gurdiv, Samir Atikantam. How are you? I am uh, a little nervous, to be honest. That's, that's, a, that's a, a very rare thing to hear from you, and I'm very happy yeah. to, that I can make you slightly nervous in this situation. Microphones, cameras, they usually do this to me. I'm not a, I'm not a big fan of these things. Perfect. So welcome to my podcast. And because this is your first appearance, I'm going to be annoying and I'm going to ask you to talk about yourself, which I know you love to do. As well. So, okay, we do the, the bad thing at the beginning. We get rid of it. Tell um, us who you are. Who I am. Uh, well, I am, as you said, Rishi Jagopal. That is my name. Um, I am 39 years old today. Today is his birthday. Uh, not when you're going to be watching this, but today is Rishi Jagopal's birthday. So I'm going to be a little bit more annoying to him which is one more thing that i don't like uh, <laughs> so we're starting off with negativity which i guess falls somehow nicely with today's topic uh, so something about myself um, apart from my age i've been um, for the last maybe 15 years i've been more or less fully dedicated to my spiritual path in the beginning more so to myself and then later on as I met Guruji and joined Bhakti Marga I've actually started being focused more on the mission and less on myself uh, which I guess is a good thing as well. Uh, I'm coming from Croatia originally where I was born, I studied. Um, I'm coming from a, how to say, normal family nothing too nothing too crazy nothing too special pretty somehow standard croatian background whoever knows croatia i guess that would be the explanation just a caveat because i may have prior knowledge of this mm -hmm. um when you say normal family yes jacob is like two meters tall right yes your family you're one of the shorter ones in your family i'm not shorter but i'm not the tallest there are there are a couple of taller people than me so regular family and right? most of them are heavier than me so <laughs> big okay. people yeah uh, and yeah, since uh, 2013, I live here in Springen. 2015, I became a brahmachari, started doing full-time seva here in, uh, in Sri Pitanilaya, and I've been doing seva first in, in Sadhana department. Then I moved over to the academy with, with you, and then I was in that department for like, what is it, five years before I moved over to the the video broadcast production department and that's where i still am part time apart with, together with all these other things that we mix in here yeah and I, and i think that's that's obviously we've as you just mentioned we spent quite a lot of time working together over the years as well um rishi jagopal is one of my my dear friends and so i think we we know each other pretty well. This I think is, I think it's important to mention that also because yeah. this, conversa this conversation might look too casual <laughs> and we might cr be crossing some lines which we shouldn't usually, but sure, sure. knowing that might might explain things. Yeah, exactly. So we're close friends and, and we've worked together for many, many years. Um, and, and I think today's topic, we're going to talk about social media and spirituality. And I think that um, two factors for why I think this is, this is the right constellation to have that conversation is i think our age range but we'll come to that in a bit um but yeah i think also also just that background the fact that you are working in uh, sort of media video broadcast all of those things and a lot of what you're doing now is for social media platforms and so it makes you think about that i think more proactively than the average person um so yeah today we're going to talk about social media and spirituality how they go together or don't um let's kick it off Let's do this. So my first point, I think my first starting point is that we're going to sound a little bit like grumpy old old men here. I'm, <laughs> I'm quite sure. Um, and I think it's because touching upon that age thing. So I'm, I'm going to be 33 this year. You just turned 39 today. Um, and so of course there's a, there's a six year gap between us, but what I, what we both sort of figured out, I think we were talking about this yesterday is that for example, the first iPhone came out in 2007, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so we were both already adults. Like I was, I was turning 18 um, and you were of course in your early twenties. Um, and so we missed sort of this boom of social media because you know, I would say smartphones really took it to the next level. Facebook existed before, but this idea of the constant in your pocket, checking all the time, et cetera. 
um, is a new phenomenon. And I think we both missed it in terms of our teenage years and childhood. And so we only face this as adults, right? Even if it's young adults, um, I think it makes a big difference. Mm. And so I think we're both part of the last generation that didn't have this during their youth, during their childhood and, and teenage years. And I, and I see a lot of people nowadays, youngsters and, and sort of the, the sons and daughters of um, devotees that I'm good friends with, et cetera. And I see how different their childhood is to what we might've experienced. And so I think we have a really unique perspective in the sense that we're not much older and have a complete sort of detachment from this reality at the same time we're at the, the threshold, let's say, of this very new reality. And I think I think that's um, why I think we're in a unique position and, and an interesting position to talk about this. Um, so my first point would be, I overall think that social media, and in social media, I'm gonna include like messaging apps, so WhatsApp, Telegrams, these kind of things. Um, you know, some people would, would exclude those, but I'm gonna include them in today's uh, uh, topics. For me, it's it's a net negative. And what I mean by that is that I recognize that there are obvious positives to social media and communication apps and all of these things that have come come around. Um, and we, we're gonna go into all of that as well. But I think overall, the negatives outweigh the positives. It's my sort of starting position. And I will unpack all of that, but I wanna know what's your starting position on that. Do you think it is balanced out, positive, negative? What's your overall assessment? Overall, I would uh, agree. Uh, I would say that there are ob obviously very clear positive sides to it. So even in the in the very beginning of this of this uh, era, uh, this was two thousand and eight. So I just moved out. I was going uh, back to my parents and out several times through my early twenties. And then at that point, I was living in Slovenia. I was studying in Ljubljana, and my brother, who uh, also lived with my parents room next to me he was my next uh, next door roommate uh he was living in new york for a couple of months and during that period when i was in slovenia and he was in america we spoke more often than when we lived rooms next to each other right because sometimes i wouldn't see him for days because we had different schedules different activities and I we wouldn't see each other but when we were far away somehow there was this uh availability or, or or the need to communicate because there's this urgency we're so far away we should you know get in touch and skype was the thing back then and we would skype every day we would talk at least for half an hour daily you know catching up how was your day what are you doing and so on so in that sense technology did make it very easy we saw it also now during this pandemic uh period how easy it was to um i mean relatively easy it was to overcome the um, uh, how to say the lack of ability to to be together to yeah. stay together the 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 zoom explosion happened people Bridge are now gap, sort of yeah right. people are now people. working remotely uh, which actually pushed us here in, in in bhakti marga to to do things very very differently actually we can talk about that later because i, I know we had a big boom sort of in our online activity because of because of that and that's obviously a positive but we'll, yeah. we'll come back to that yeah but overall the way we communicate the way we are bombarded with information i guess we can talk about it in more detail later um is just i think negative and i think it's not even the social media social media is just one of the catalysts that are present in the world as the world goes in the way that it's going mm -hmm. that it's evolving or devolving depends on which period we're in uh social media is just one of those elements that that propel things to pro go into a certain direction in a certain way that i think touches upon a, an interesting point because sometimes people make the argument that the tool isn't inherently bad it's just about how you use it i will push back on that a little bit and i think that's a that's a good sort of qualifying opening statement that you can take something, and I've heard this argument being used in so many different use cases. Like you say, look at a gun. A gun can both kill or protect life. It can take away life, it can protect life. Okay, fair enough. But you look at social media and they say, look, social media isn't inherently bad. These tools, these Instagrams and TikToks and whatever, they're not inherently bad. It just depends what content you put on it, what content you're consuming on it, all of these things. So it really comes down to your own quality of your consciousness and all of these things. I disagree for one simple reason is that these tools are designed to um, to customize your experience almost to a point where you don't control it, right? So it's not that you are fully in control of the experience that you are receiving. So take something like 
um, TikTok, whatever, whatever it may be, there are algorithms in play that are attempting to, and there are ways to mitigate this, but they're attempting to um, customize your experience as per their interests. Marketers, people who are trying to sell you things, whatever it may be. And so I feel like they are designed to play on our attention spans. They're designed to play on our desires. They're, they are designed to accentuate parts of us specifically. It's not, they're not neutral platforms that have no inherent bias to them, pushing you in one direction or another, like where it's really just you create the canvas that you want, right? It's not like that. They do have their own agendas. They're trying to make money. They have their advertisers. They have all of these things. And so I, I just want to sort of eliminate that argument. Not that again, I, and we will talk about this, I'm sure, how we can make the best of it. It's important that we also put a, a positive spin on this at the end, because I feel like we're almost at a stage where we can't sit here and say, get off social media, everybody. Just don't do it. It's terrible. I don't think it's going gonna, it's gonna to fall on deaf ears, right? So it's really a question of just best practices. But I, would, I do think that starting off, I don't accept the argument that it's, it's a blank canvas and it's just about what you make of it. No, I think it is inherently designed to, uh, to attack sometimes the worst parts of, of you. And especially when we, when we go into the spiritual sort of dimension and start talking about the human mind and, and the human consciousness and all of this, um, which we'll come to. But do you agree with that? The idea that it is inherently programmed in a certain direction? Well, it, I don't need to agree the facts, right? <laughs> it, it factually is so. So it's it's made the people that make it, they want to make it, they have to make it um, also financially sustainable. So yeah. and the uh, the people driving that, the are the, the advertisers, they're all fighting for our attention. So it's they're making them more. They're making all these social media apps. Uh, more and more conducive to retaining our attention retaining but that's that's the measure of success what's the you know what's the retention rate what yeah. is the how long are people watching or or reading and stuff like that so that's that's the actual success so if some some app is managing to keep somebody 6 hours a day glued to the screen that's a good app so obviously <laughs> great app obviously, what an app obviously <laughs> yeah it's not a good thing yeah even even if I mean, if that person is, I don't know, studying physics six hours a day, okay, maybe you can find a way. But then what do you do after those couple of years when you've done studying? Are you then moving on to, you know, getting a job? No, you just, the next step is consume more, take right. another app. It's not, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm do, not do buying that. Do you know something crazy? Do you know something crazy? So I, I again, like crazy. I don't know how reliable these reports are, but, you know, Pew Research Centers and these kind of places that do these statistical, you know, analyses. Um, I think it was 2022, that from the ages of 13 to 18, teenagers spend on average nine hours a day on social media. Yeah, that's crazy. Nine hours. That is crazy. And when you consider that most of these people are sleeping between six, eight, sometimes even more hours a day, I mean, like literally that's uh, nine plus eight, like 17 hours are gone of your 24 hours. Okay, you still got your seven for you know eating and, and going to school which people between the ages of 13 and 18 usually do because again i'm just talking about 13 to 18 so you still got to calculate in there about what at least six hours of school yeah and it's like do the math then like they're literally every single free moment on social media during class probably, probably as well. yeah, exactly <laughs> probably. How, how does that all add up right i don't know um and that's that's intense and I, if you think if, if they went down to it was uh, from the ages of eight to 12 it goes down to six hours a day Wow. But to think an eight-year-old is spending six hours a day on social media, right? Um, and and that, that's what I mean about our generation. Like, we didn't do that because it, didn't, it wasn't available to us. It didn't right? exist, yeah. It didn't exist. But this is the thing, and I think it's so fresh. We don't, this is the first generation that's, of kids that are being born into this world, right? They don't know anything else. They don't have any other reference of what it is to live without these things. And I think we're going to experience over the next decades a huge... Um, a, it's, it's like a reckoning. We're going to realize that we don't know how to navigate this or we don't know fully the long-term effects of this kind of uh, human experience um, because all the things that we did and we take for granted, human connection and, and, and outdoor activities and whatever else it may be, just don't exist. They just don't exist in the same way anymore. Um, but again, we, we can come to that. I just want to go now straight to the spiritual dimension of this because the idea is social media impacting spiritual life. So spiritual life in general, has as an objective, if we're talking now 
Vedic conception, Vaishnava conception. Bhagavad Gita is one of our sort of primary texts. We're looking at spiritual life as a problem that needs to be solved in the fact that we misidentify with this material world. We misidentify with our material bodies, our mind, desires, all of these things. And we're trying to get out of this. We're trying to realize who we truly are. We're trying to see the world as it truly is, make a connection with God. And the Bhagavad Gita chapter 2, verse 62 and 63, for me, have always been the formula, the explanation for human problems, for all human, for all like negative human outcomes and human experiences. And I think it fits to the social media topic perfectly, right? So for those of you who don't know, so verses 62 and 63, I call it, um, I've coined it almost, almost like this Ashtabuja demon. So it's like an eight armed demon because there are eight steps to this. Krishna maps out a formula which starts with deliberating on sense objects. So that means whenever you look upon anything that is alluring to your senses, you are deliberating upon a sense object. That item is a sense object. So that's the first step. As you allow yourself to freely in an unrestricted manner deliberate upon the sense objects, attachment is formed. So you grow, you literally attach yourself to it consciously. <clears throat> your consciousness attaches to that item. It, it creates a bond. It's a bond. From that desire emerges. That's the third arm. And so desire is this idea that I must have it. I must engage it. I must with it. I must experience it, etc. And the next step is already where the downfall starts. It's anger. Krishna lists anger as the, the resulting factor. I sometimes like to swap anger for frustration because I think Anger can be quite an intense experience and people sometimes don't relate to it. They think, well, I'm not really angry when things don't work out the way I want, but I do get frustrated, right? So that's the, the, the first sort of half of the formula. It's I allow my senses to look for their sense objects in an unrestricted way. I form attachments to them, bonds to them, and those bonds create desire, the, the want to experience, interact with those things. And when inevitably I am unable to have everything that I desire, I become angry or frustrated. There's frustration experienced inside oneself. Second half of that equation. As a result of that frustration, um, there is a, a delusion experience. So delusion means my mind, my faculty of, of, of understanding, my consciousness becomes disturbed. And I always like to use the analogy of uh, water. So a bed of water, if you have still water, you can see straight through it, clean, pure water, and you can see the contents. But if something disturbs the water. For example, there's sand also at the bottom and it all comes up because of the disturbance, suddenly you can see nothing. So that's delusion. It's something that was previously clear now becomes unclear. So delusion arises because the mind gets agitated. So if you see your mind as that bed of water, right? This is all familiar to you, but let's map it out for everybody. So after delusion, the, the sixth arm is uh, a loss of memory. So loss of memory means you become selective in what you see, because as the water is disturbed, some things come to the surface, which you see clearly, but you don't see the things that are lost in the sand or lost in the activity of the water, so to speak. So in your mind, it's the same. You want something, you become frustrated because you don't get it, and you lose perspective. And in that loss of perspective, that the you get a loss of memory in the sense that you start to see the thing that frustrates you, but you lose wider context. You lose the context of, okay, but I'm wiser than this. I've experienced this before. I know how to navigate this. This isn't really all that it's, you know, build up to be. And so I think these are some of the things that, that happen in that loss of memory stage. The seventh arm is a loss of discrimination. So if I have parts of my wisdom obscured, if I lose memory, so to speak, in that given moment, because I'm blinded by my frustration, my anger, then I lose the ability to discriminate between black and white, what is right, what is wrong, because I don't have access to the full picture, my own full picture. I'm not saying, you know, the universal full picture, but our own experiences, are, are our own intelligence is compromised. So therefore, of course, I. how can we make good decisions? So it's, it's really, you, you lose the ability to make good decisions. And then the eighth arm, which is more of a conclusion, it's therefore you become lost. That's Krishna's assessment of the human condition. And I think it's so spot on to every negative human experience that I've ever had. I can reverse engineer it with these eight steps. At some point, I allowed myself in an unrestricted manner to form bonds that created desires, and I've never had them the exact way I imagined or wished for. And I get frustrated as a result of this. I become deluded. I lose my, my memory. And because of this, my decision-making becomes compromised, and I make bad decisions that, in the end, frustrate my, my every effort, and I become, quote-unquote, lost. Um, now, let's take this formula 
and say, if that is the general human condition that we're trying to escape from, we're trying to correct this, the very first correction should be, I don't allow my senses to run after their sense objects in an unrestricted manner because I don't want to create bonds and desires and all of the resulting issues. Social media, as far as I can tell, and it does have positives, I'm constantly qualifying that, is designed to entice your senses to deliberate upon them, upon the contents of social media. To grab your attention. It is designed to grab your attention. So it's literally saying, I want to propagate the human problem, the problem of the human condition as Krishna maps it out. And so at that very root level, I struggle to justify it as not being antagonistic to, to spiritual life or to spiritual progress. Now I know that there is plenty of content on social media that is spiritually beneficial, no doubt about it. But I'm talking now, and exceptions can always exist, and I'm not trying to sort of make blanket statements here. But if we're making an overall assessment, is it more, is social media more populated with content that is going to be helpful to to your spiritual progress or not? I don't think we need to have that discussion. I think it's clear what the answer is there. And so I think that's the very first and foundational connection between the spiritual world, spiritual ideas, and, and social media, and, and the biggest and biggest, um, most prominent problem that we need to, to address here. What do you think? Well, going back to the time when I said I started with my spiritual path in 2008, I've, I've become aware uh, of, of this process somehow intuitively. And there are things that you, so the, I guess the first adjust, adjustments that people make when they become actively spiritual, whatever that means for anybody, um, you start developing your diet in terms of, you know, multiple things, that, in terms of what you consume as food, but also what you consume as media, what you watch, what you read, and so on. So right. your your taste changes. You, you, you eat different things, but you also read different things, you watch different things. So one of the things that I did is I stopped watching TV. That was that was a thing back then. There's no TV anymore, but I guess that would be Netflix or social media or stuff like that nowadays. And that's 2008. I did that, uh, but I realized I was still as much as I stopped watching TV. For example, I was still spending a lot of time on Facebook because right. that's what was the thing back then, 2008, 9, 10. And then I cut Facebook off completely, and I um, you couldn't delete Facebook, so I've uh, what was it? Uh, deactivated deactivated or, right, something like right. that yeah uh, and I didn't have any social media I didn't I didn't even have a I didn't have a smartphone for a couple of years until 2015 again uh, because we were doing a 10 year anniversary here and everybody was uh, asked if we can just use our social media channels to promote the event and I was like yeah sure let's do it so I activate my social media so there was a quite a gap there that right. I had without a phone, without social media and so on. And then it picked up quite a bit in that period. So when I got back to it, in the beginning, I could really see, I could really see it how it is. But then within, let's say six months, I started not seeing it the way it is. And it was just an everyday thing. Like it was just a normal thing. So that process happened as you, the, the process as you just nicely now described that Krishna describes in the Bhagavad Gita. It happened in my background, in the background of my mind, without me noticing. Yeah. Same thing happened uh, with TikTok. I think it was about six months ago. Mm-hmm. So uh, TikTok is is the devil. That is the that's the mantra that everybody knows. TikTok is the devil. <laughs> everybody knows. Everybody knows this. <laughs> of all the social media, TikTok is the worst. Um, because it comes from China, that's how it is. Uh, but again, is it? I was curious because I don't like to be, you know, I'm, I still have some quite some pride, so I don't like to be told what to think. So I need to check this net, uh, YouTube, yeah, uh, TikTok. Sorry, because Pavan also told me. Uh, he said one, one one boy here, close. Uh, he's a teenager. He said last year. He told me or two years ago. He said that he installed. Uh, TikTok on his phone and he was 17 at the time or 16 and he said that first day he spent nine hours on TikTok and then he just deleted it because good boy (laughs) self-control some (laughs) self-restraint happened he just deleted TikTok and never got back to it right so I heard that but again okay that's his experience 
And then we start publishing on TikTok. We're producing these reels. Okay, what is TikTok? Like, I need to now understand from even my service point of view, right. what are we producing for? Where are, what are we feeding? So I download TikTok. I make an account. Um, and it just starts immediately just giving you stuff. There's no... Like normal social media, other social media, not normal, other social media, like, I don't know, YouTube or Facebook or Instagram even, you don't get really stuff before you ask for it. Exactly. You have to, you have to like sort of choose who you follow and then you get their content, right? TikTok, you open, no questions asked. You're just <laughs> getting stuff there. Yeah. And it was all the stuff that I didn't want. Yeah. It was all the stuff that I didn't want. Yeah. It was just like r stuff that is popular in the region. It was some... German kids doing dances. Let me, let me touch on that for a second. Because I think TikTok is unique in that way that, I mean, I think the internet in general has issues with like providing appropriate content to people, like age appropriate and things like that. I think TikTok's even worse in that respect because exactly like you said, you just go on it and it just gives you stuff, whether you've asked for it or not. And, and imagine you were a kid, right? Imagine you're 10 years old or whatever. And, and you make your account and you open it up. I, I When I did that, I, I made an account just again to see what the fuss was all about. Yeah. Um, Within the first sort of 10 minutes of scrolling, I had seen at least four or five videos where I was like, yeah, this would be really wrong for a 10 year old kid to see. Like this would be really wrong. And I'm not gonna go into details, but and I was just like, whoa, like this is a little, like there's no filter here. Like this is a little weird. Legally right? they put a filter, if, but because you're legally as a parent obliged to observe what your kids are doing, sure. so they shouldn't be installing but let's apps be real. For, for adults. It's not what's going on. I know, but... But okay, anyway, I interrupted it's available, you. I interrupted it's you. available to kids. But yeah, even like in the beginning I was getting all this random, inappropriate, irrelevant stuff, but then it f monitors my behavior. So it sees what I quickly discard it yeah. and it sees where I stayed for a while and it just starts adjusting and it's very fast yeah. and then I'll search for certain things I'll search for like Guruji's TikTok channel I'll search for Bhakti Marga posts I'll search for other devotees and so on it very quickly uh, adjusts and it gives me things that I want to see and then from there on from there on it started to slowly change what I like <laughs> So it gave me things that I, that I obviously came for. Right. And then how about this, which is a couple of degrees off? Yeah. That's not that bad. Yeah. And then it just starts giving you all, like <laughs> little, little by little, it's, it's stretching you and expanding your, your like range of attention to start seeing other things. And then again, there are certain things that I don't find problematic. Like there are uh, TikTok itself, I, I think it's it's just a better app than than other in in many regards, just technically better executed. Uh, and the number of content creators present there is is very, very high. It's probably matching YouTube mm -hmm. um, because it's just I guess they choose that platform because of it performs better and so on. Um, but there are certain things that are very useful, like there's a lot of DIY stuff that you find there. A lot of, you know, you, you find a lot of inspiration for new hobbies. You find, I was even contemplating that we <clears throat> produce videos about deity worship and put it there. Because again, once you engage with things you like, it motivates you to do that stuff by yourself. Like, I don't know, I like having a clean environment. So... I saw somebody cleaning their house and I just watched the whole video. And then the mm -hmm. next one came up and I just felt very easy to clean my house because I was in that vibe, I was in that energy. So again, you can find certain positive things. Yeah. But overall, it does push me to look at my to 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 look at my phone. Yeah. It pushes me into going outside of myself into something that is not even reality it's kind of a reality but it's less of a reality than actual interaction with with the world is yeah so again it's i can i can see it it's just, i had like conversations with chat gpt lately also so i can start to connect patterns like how that ai is talking to me and having certain goals with me, so I, I don't, I have no, I, I cannot explain that, but it's, it has, I feel like it has certain agenda mm -hmm. and I can feel a similar type of agenda with the social media. I'm 
slightly pushed off. And it's and I'm not being immediately bombarded because I'm going to discard it. They know this. They give me things that are just just a little bit off from what I want, but it's in, in a direction that I'm going to get something? more engaged. Yeah, please. Can I read you something? So this morning I I, I was here in the temple at Sri Patanilaya and I gave a, a talk um, about Maya. Mm-hmm. So the the illusory energy of the Lord. Um, and, and after I gave the satsang, one of the residents here um, at the ashram um, reached out to me and said she really enjoyed the satsang and she had just written like a little verse herself, which was um, about the topic. And she said, look, it fits perfectly with what you were saying this morning. Can I send it to you? And she sent it to me. And I actually really like it. So I'm going to read it to you. So she, she titled this verse, The Trap. And she said, the most dangerous thing about a trap, not knowing that you are in one. The next most dangerous, not minding. Behold the power of Maya. And I was like, yeah, very, very accurate. Spot on, right? Um, and the reason I wanted to read that is because everything you were saying to me was just sort of pushing me in that direction. It's this thing of, this is what I want. And I feel like I'm in control of my experience, but here it's going to send me two degrees off of what I want. So my new normal is now this. It's expanded a little bit. And now they're going to send me another two degrees off. And it's this trap that they're, they're putting you in of, I, we want to keep you interested. Because they understand, social media understands stagnation, that if you keep getting the same content, you also can get bored. And they need to make their money and they make their money by you being on their app. And so they're gonna constantly try to suggest you new things to keep you interested in expanding your horizons. And the more broad your horizon is, the more likely you're gonna spend more hours on that app. And so when you're trying to narrow and restrict and control, as we were saying spiritually, you have to restrict your sense, your senses from just running wild. Social media is trying to say, let it let them a little bit more loose, like free them up a bit more. That's what I mean about it's not that I'm 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 saying that there's some conspiracy theories going on here, or it's some like deeply nefarious thing. It's just basic facts that they need you to be interested consistently, to captivate your attention. And there is an infinite content in the very, very minute sort of area that you think is actually spiritually beneficial for you. And so they're constantly going to be trying to push your horizons wider and wider and opening them up and so that's the the quote-unquote trap and then they 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 don't let's you don't know that you're in the trap and then even when you do sit and think about it and figure it out like ah actually now i've been spending time looking at sort of house renovation stuff or whatever it may be or loaning or something like that (laughs) lawn mowing mowing. (laughs) Mowing. (laughs) mowing. i do that sometimes too you know when you spend time with that you go ah it's okay it's not a big deal and that's that second part of the of what she she just sent to me that that resident that and then the worst thing is that you don't mind you're like yeah it's all right it's not a big deal complacency yeah and you just Comfort settle into zone. it yeah behold the power of maya and and that's part of the big problem that i want to address because as spiritual people again not to sound like some preacher telling everyone just get off social media that's not what i'm saying but we got to be more conscious and and to be more conscious means to let the knowledge you have inform your decisions. So for example, if you just take chapter two, verses 62 and 63, as I mapped them out earlier, these, this eight-armed demon, so to speak, just be conscious of this. And, and because you have knowledge of this, let that knowledge influence your decision-making processes. Don't be oblivious to the fact that you are smarter than this. Like, let yourself be smarter. Let yourself be the intelligent person that you are. And I know it's not easy, But if you're not willing to do that, then you're basically letting yourself become whatever people want you to be. I remember, um, going off on a tangent now, but I remember a conversation I had. I was with Swami Aniruddha, one of my god brothers, and we were in um, Austria at a darshan with Guruji. And, you know, we both had a certain standing in the mission. We we, we both, obviously, it would not be um, wrong to assume that we should have been there talking to people and helping them sort of connect to to the mission and to Guruji and spirituality, sort of, in, a, in I don't like the word, but in a sense, preaching to them, right? I don't like the idea of preaching, but, you know, for want of a better expression. But we weren't. We were sitting in a corner talking amongst ourselves, right? Sort of minding our own business, just out of the, the limelight and talking to each other, having a good time. And one of the one of the devotees, a more senior devotee in the sense that, you know, um, more experienced in, in this world, um, came up to us and said, what are you two doing here? And we sort of were like, who, who, are you? who is this person to come and talk to us like that? You know, my, my ego flared up. And she said, um, you know, 
if you're not preaching to the world, the world will always be preaching to you. It doesn't have a pause button, right? If you're not spreading who you are and your values and your principles, if you're not putting that out into the world, then the world is putting its values into you. There's no pause here. Like it's constant exchange going on. And she was upset. She's like, you should be here preaching to these people. Otherwise, Maya is preaching to you, right? It stuck with me because I, we both sort of it had that initial flare up of like, what, who's she to come and tell us anything? And then we both sort of looked at each other and agreed. Like she was right, point blank. And I think it connects very much to this topic of social media because it's the same thing. It's like, if I'm not consciously using my intelligence to, to affect my decisions, then I am letting the intelligence of the social media apps, of the content creators, of whoever it is, affect my decision making. If I'm not using my intelligence, then other intelligence will use and affect my decision making faculty. And my decisions are what lead to the outcomes in my life. I will become the, the result of my decisions, my choices, quote unquote. And if I'm not proactively taking them, then who's making them for me? Who? Algorithms, right? And that's, I think, the fundamental problem. But it's one of the things that Guruji keeps saying, like one of the things that he keeps repeating always is to constantly remind ourselves of why we are here and what we are supposed to do, like mm -hmm. what the goal is. Yeah. So I think that's the preaching that is, would be the, the first thing that we need to do. We need to preach to ourselves, remind ourselves constantly why we are here. Yeah. And if we're doing that, then we're automatically preaching outside as well. Um, but yeah, social media, internet, I think it's just, it's just a, another, as I said before, I guess I'm repeating now, it's just another aspect of this world that is designed in a way to keep us engaged. Because again, coming back to the verse in the Bhagavad Gita, our mind and our body uh, are made out of these five elements mm -hmm. and the world is made of these five elements and they naturally attract each other. So they will naturally want to interact. Our our mind and our body wants to interact with the world. It's just there's just this physical attraction between them, natural, very physics. Um, but the knowledge of why we are here and understanding of these processes and understanding how to get out of this would yeah. be would be then essential. It's not even it's not like world is bad, social media is bad, internet's bad. Again, it's not that. But it will do unless you know what this does. It's gonna it's gonna do things to you that you don't want. Right. That, yeah. That's exactly the point. That, that's you hit the nail on the head. It's if you don't know, it's going to do things to you and, and you can stop it by being clear about what it is that you want for yourself. And so I always tell this to people in general, and this is a general spiritual advice or life advice. It's nothing to do with social media. In fact, it's, normal life also gets affected by this. It is, and this is exactly what I was saying earlier, and it's Guruji, something, something that Guruji has told me and others many times in this, if you don't know who you want to be, and if you don't actively try to make a coherent alignment between your thoughts, actions, words, then you will always be the byproduct of your environment. And, and that's not a good thing. Like we talk about going with the flow and adapting to your circumstances, but adapt who you want to be to your circumstances. Don't define yourself by your circumstances because that's, in the end, who are you? You're nobody. You're nobody. You stand for nothing. You, you are literally a blank canvas that your environment and other people can, can define for you. And that is the greatest tragedy of all of this. And so forget social media for a second. If you become clear about who it is that you want to be, I want to be a respectful person, then you will give respect even before you get it. One of the, one of the most common expressions I ever heard as a child was um, sort of respect is earned, right? And I was thinking to myself, okay, cool. So I've got to act in a certain way to earn people's respect. But automatically you think the same way, meaning they have to earn mine too. I'm also going to participate in that game in the reverse. Guruji never told me this. Guruji's first message to me when, I, when he initiated me as a sannyasi, as a swami, was you give respect irrespective of whether you get it first or not. Because it's who you want to be. It's who you are. It's who I want you to be. You lead by example pretty much, yeah. It's, it's even more than that. It's I need to be clear. I need to define clearly in my mind, in my sankalpa, my intention, my intention, who, are, who do I want to be? Who is the, what, is the, what are the qualities I'm supposed to be living by and propagating? So for example, I want to be a loving person. I want to be a respectful person. I want to be a kind person. Then be that irrespective of your environment. You can adjust here and there, but 
ultimately it's your responsibility to proactively do that. And I think if you have that, then I don't need to talk to you about social media because you're going to govern it yourself. You're going to make sure that if a, if a social media app, like, like Bhavan, you mentioned, 17 year old, turns it on nine hours, he says, that's not who I want to be, uninstalls it, right? It's, it's got to match who you want to be. And the minute you feel like I can't control this, I can't shape this to um, match the person that I want to be and I find it counterproductive, I, I, I just need to detach myself from it. I'm out. Yeah. So like you said, and, and this I think comes now to a positive. Let's talk about a positive, which is something like YouTube. I'm, I'm often on YouTube. I watch a lot of YouTube. Mm. But that's because I find a lot of really interesting content on it that is completely relevant to who I want to be and what I'm supposed to be sort of developing in myself, representing, et cetera. So I've, I've told this to people before. I, one of the ways people ask me sometimes, maybe they've asked you the same, how have you gotten to the point that you are now in terms of your knowledge or your speaking or your whatever? And a huge chunk of that is, of course, my guru, Paramahamsa Vishwananda, the biggest chunk. But I'm, I would also be lying if I didn't admit that I have spent hours consuming content that has been incredibly positive to my accumulation of, of perspective and knowledge and experience and whatever else on platforms like YouTube. But I felt like I was always in control. Nothing was shown to me unless I clicked on it. It wasn't an automatic thing. I had my ad blockers, <laughs> no ads, thank you very much. I could uh, control who it is that I'm subscribing to, following, whatever it may be. And so I felt very much in control. So I could still be the person that I wanted to be without exposing myself to anything else, right? I don't have that experience all the time with something like an Instagram or a TikTok. I don't feel that way at least. I, they, they send me suggested posts and I'm scrolling down because of the nature of the app. I don't know what's coming next. Every third post is something that you didn't ask for. Yeah. Or an advertisement of some, you know, they, they, they see your shopping history and they put something or whatever, right? That doesn't happen to me in my YouTube experience. And so this is what I'm talking about where nobody needs to be babied. About, we don't need to baby anybody about how to use social media. It's more get that clarity about who you want to be as a person and what the values that you want to stand for are, irrespective of what any environment is, is, is showing you or telling you. And if you really sincerely mean that, you'll govern yourself. You'll know what to do or what not to do, which social media apps to use, which ones to perhaps try to avoid a bit more. What do you think about that? Well, I think it's essential, definitely, in life, regardless, regardless of the situation, regardless of what the context is and what the topic of discussion is, that that we know who we are, what we're supposed to be. I guess that's the, that's the main goal in life. Uh, and if we're clear about where we want to get, the, the, how to say, different results that we get from different actions are going to clearly tell us do we want to continue with those actions or not. So again, internet, social media, they just are what they are. We can blame them for things, we can praise them for things, but they are just what they are. It's like hot iron. If you put your hand on a hot iron, your hand's going to melt. You can, you know, you can think about it whatever you want. It's right. just the nature of things. That's yeah. what happens. So sense objects are there. Uh, again, social media, I don't, again, as you said, I don't like vilifying it or anything uh, in that sense because it's just offsetting our responsibility onto someone else. It's saying that they are controlling us. You know, it's the man, it's the social mm. media, it's the corporations or whatever. Nobody's r responsible for my for my well-being. No, nobody can do it. I mean, there can be war and somebody can, somebody can be shooting at me, but that's not, what, not, not what's going on. This is a different kind of warfare. This is yeah. just general exposure to the world. We are exposed now more than we ever were. We have more access than we ever had. And again, as you pointed out in your YouTube uh, example, we now have access to information that we never had. Like I remember in the in the 90s when i when i needed to find some information i had to go to the library talk to the librarian yes. ask if there are any books on the subject um and then he she may knows probably where to find it i go f they go check if the book is even in the house because it may be rented out if it's like some some older bigger books they they are not rented out they can only be looked at in the library and you get your time with the book and when you need to find it, like it's, it was a very different time yeah. now. And, and that's, I lived in Split. It's not a big city, like in Croatia. The library wasn't the biggest one in the world. 
and you just don't have information. It doesn't exist. Right, right. And the information that you do get, it's maybe from one person. What are they, where did they get the knowledge from? What, the, what are the references? Now you Google or any kind of search engine you want to use. But I'll say even, even yeah. more than Google because yeah. I was going to say this is actually a huge plus of social media over just the internet. Because it's not just because the internet facilitates all these things. You can research and find things. But no, no, social media for me is even better because in this respect, and this is a huge plus of social media. Even on the internet, an internet without social media means if I research a topic, I'm still going to find official papers from universities or from whatever else on YouTube, for example. Yeah, there'll be, there's going to be a debate. There's going to be a verification underneath right, that video. Right, and, and interaction and conversations about it. And, and as well as that, it gives platforms to people who don't go the traditional route. They're not professors at universities that can publish these papers or write these books or whatever else. Alas. Right and here, this, exactly. Yeah. The fact that we're able to make this podcast and we're able, I'm able to upload this and people can watch and have this information is to the immense credit of social media. That's not just the internet. That's social media that yeah. allows that to happen. Yeah. And that I'm, I'm 100% on board. This is fantastic. And it's a huge, huge, huge positive. People get online. And they watch Guruji. Yeah, that's a huge one, obviously. Back in the day, if we're talking 20 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. 12 years ago. Okay, let's go there. I would find a picture of Guruji and that would be my interaction with him for a week. Because right. next week, a next blog post comes with one more picture. Right. And right. then I have that picture. Right. That's, that was it. And if someone wants to, to get in touch with him, and they'd have to fly out to wherever he is. Yeah. And there is a plus to that, but there's also a negative, which is what if you just don't have the money? Yeah, like it's not not everyone's budget allows these kind of things. Look, I'm from Brazil originally. I, I know so many devotees in Brazil. They don't have the budget to fly out to Europe. They yeah. can't go to these places. Forget it. But the fact that they can now go on a YouTube video, watch him, put auto generated subtitles in Portuguese, and just can and have a, have a relationship with his teachings, that I, I cannot overstate how wonderful that is. Maybe the, we could take this moment now. We're, we're going on a positive wave. Tell us a little bit about how that changed in Bhakti Marga. And yes, okay, because of Corona also, but um, what are some of the real big positives that we've done in terms of reaching out to people through social media, through the internet and whatever else? Well, Guruji was the one making these these pushes mainly because like we have, because he's, he's the kind of main force bef- behind anything. We can try to do stuff, but when he changes his direction, that's yeah. when things start happening. So in 20. 20, 2020, he was in Vrindavan, you were there. Lockdown came in India. Yeah. And he's decided to um, he decided to give a satsang every day and to do japa with the devotees together every day. There was like a satsang and, and, and japa, there was a gathering online with all the people that are locked up in their houses. Here in, 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 in Shripitanila, in Germany, we were doing it, we were going together in the temple and doing it with him. Uh, in India and then he came back after that period and uh, he wanted to continue doing these daily live streams which never happened before we would go we would have live streams we, we would live streaming prayers but it was a very closed environment well defined it was easy for one person to operate but this was a whole new whole new beast whole new universe and I happened to be there and I just moved over to that department I was given over the video department to take care of and we had no people, we had no skill, we had no, no equipment. Uh, because of lockdown, China was shut down, so you couldn't buy any gear. No, uh, yeah. A 60 euro webcam was going on eBay for 400, 500. I remember that. Yeah, I remember and, and you couldn't get them even. So it was just, it was, nothing was available. So it was this insane push to go online and to do stuff like video online, real time, everything was real. It was a lot of stress here. Uh, I can not mention that, but but uh, it was also it was just uh, a, a crazy moment where, like, uh, because of problems again, like there was we, we had moments because Guruji was in quarantine. He was supposed to stay alone for the first two weeks when he was here. He was personally quarantined. He 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 went with it for two weeks. So he would sit in the apartment where he was quarantined, and I was the only one who was allowed to come there. And I would be in the corridor, like five meters away from him, and film him from there. I would leave a disinfected microphone next to his door. <laughs> He would take it, put it on. He would spray it. I was always thinking he's going to break the thing. He would like <laughs> soak it in this disinfecting thing when he was giving it back. 
and uh, so it was it was just this he was there doing his thing and i was in the in the corridor struggling because it was it was all makeshift because yeah. we, it was, i can't that would need an hour to explain all the problems that we had so on some of those days like a battery would go out on a camera mid live stream and that stupid camera would even have a warning sign on the screen battery exhausted <laughs> <laughs> and that went out in the live stream and Gro- then, growing pains right man the pressure cooker and then i would get i would get like 25 messages on my telegram from from devotees all over the world the live stream stopped i'd be like yes i know. <laughs> i'm well aware i'm very well aware or like i'm listening to i'm monitoring the sound mm-hmm. and there are audio dropouts and it's not going to be during silent moments it's when guruji is talking and I realized it's the connector on the camera because it's, it's it's it was all janky, and so the receiver is hanging on the on the camera, pulling the connector down, so it starts losing contact. And the moment I make any moves, Guruji thinks something is wrong, so I I need to minimize my movements. But then then also I realized uh, maybe I'll tell it later. What I realized then, uh, so I would adjust that and then try to struggle with that. And my phone is buzzing. I'm getting messages saying there are issues with audio and so on. So the level of interaction, level of unity, even even through those problems that that I had with with the devotees globally, was right. was uh, I'm, I'm parallel. It was crazy. It was great, <laughs> uh, but it was stressful. But maybe I mentioned one of the things that I learned in that period was. Uh, if I have a stressed face, Guruji is going to pick it up and he's going to show it back at, back at me. So <laughs> if I'm stressed, he's going to amplify that. So he, w- he was even bashing me directly. On, on the live stream. You know, yeah, yeah, in yeah. the program. How I'm trash and everything and how everything was great in India. And I knew it wasn't, but <laughs> <laughs> you can't argue back <laughs> during the live stream. Uh, but again... And all of that was made possible because of because of this technology, because of the internet, and even because of COVID. Like even COVID had positive impact on on on, on people. On like, we really got together. Like I remember here in the in in the in the ashram itself, we were pushed to to come together and, and really had some positive progress due to that. And again, mm-hmm. there are some positive things, but. I can see the more we're going in that direction. Myself, for example, I'm more focused on what people are, what devotees, for example, what they're watching, which mm-hmm. program we're making, than how I interact with them when they come here or when I see them abroad. When I see them abroad, a bit less because I'm more right. in a different mood. But when I'm here, I'm predominantly focused on what the program's like. And it's the same kind of a distraction where you go off somehow from what the basics are i think and it just again brings you back brings you back brings you back to why are we here what are we supposed to do use it as a tool don't let it use you don't make it control you social media same thing we are reaching out yesterday i actually showed you so that uh, there's this man in italy that just met guruji oh yeah, yeah, yeah since two three years he's been trying to meet him but it's not working he's praying to meet him and yesterday he met him and he kept his relationship with him through YouTube and, and social media. So again, fantastic. Incredible even. Incredible for him. Great for him. Yeah. But I know some devotees that would go there to to watch Guruji's live stream and they would go off on, I don't know, whatever other content was there. I struggle with that. Yeah. Not personally, I mean, I struggle making my opinion on that because I, with the example you gave now of this of this gentleman who's been having a relationship with Guruji purely through social media and YouTube for a few years and has benefited from that, and now as a sort of culmination to that has met him physically, I find that it's difficult to describe how good that is, right? And and look, we can in in a non spiritual environment we can talk about that as well, like families who can stay in touch, yeah, despite having you know jobs far away or whatever imagine some soldier goes to the army and he can still facetime his family and all of these things i think there are you know real real benefits to this stuff that you can't put a number on you can't sort of quantify but at the same time i also see the other side of it which is i see people who become complacent and who think i'll just watch the youtube i don't need to go see him anymore i don't need to make big concrete steps in my life to change 
and and I don't know what the net positive or negative is on this because I think and this touches upon another point I wanted to talk about today. Human interaction, communication is a dying art in my opinion. And it's because, and, and it's something I personally don't like at all. Um, and this is where I'm going to sound really old. <laughs> I use apps like Telegram, WhatsApp, Slack, and all of these things. Um, and of course, they're essential work tools. I, at this point, it's impossible to work without them. At this it's point, irresponsible, even you must. Yeah. I have to. It's, they've replaced email. It's it's part of my 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 saver as a as a person who has responsibility in this movement and whatever else. So I, I understand the necessity, but it's so unnatural. It's so unnatural because right now we're talking to each other. We're looking at each other's faces. We know tone of voice. We know your your facial expressions. I know everything, and I can really extract intent meaning from everything you're saying to me if you write these things to me i can interpret it the way i like right unless you put loads of accompanying emojis or whatever to make sure that i can somehow contextualize oh he means this is a joke or he's you know it's incredibly difficult and and it leaves room for a lot of misinterpretation but worse than all of this is it's the um the amount of interaction that you're expected to have as a human being so i'll give you an example um, I'm often accused of being scarcely available on these on these apps. I have struggled for a long time to come to terms with that because I think I'm actually very much on these apps. I'm constantly writing to people. But then I realize, aha, here's the problem. If 50 people write to me in one day and I answer 10, I've had 10 conversations with people today. That's a busy day of, of interaction. If I've had 10 meaningful conversations with people in one day, I'm a social person. I'm an extroverted person. Like I'm responsive. I'm doing all of these things. But if 50 try to have a conversation with me every day, there's going to be 40 people every day thinking I'm unresponsive. I'm not available. I'm this, that, and the other. Now, in, in a real life situation, that doesn't happen. Just now, before we started recording this podcast, I was in the lobby here at the ashram and I was um, sitting on my, on my iPad taking some notes and, and um, having a little breakfast. And a couple of devotees approached me to speak to me, but they could see that I was half busy. And so they approached me reticent and said, do you mind? Do you have five minutes for me? So they understand by, by the visual sort of cues that I am kind of busy, but they can make a request. Do I have five minutes? And I gave them that time. As I spoke to them, I could see others walking behind them who looked at me and I could tell they probably wanted to talk to me, but they saw he's busy. So I'm not going to go talk to him. And so nobody attempted to talk to me. They allowed me to have my conversation with these persons, a quality conversation, then it ended and I was able to move on to the next thing, come here and record this podcast. On communication apps, Telegram, WhatsApp, that doesn't happen because they just see my little green sign, I'm online, right? So they don't know that I'm talking to someone else or I'm having a very deep conversation with somebody that requires, requires my full attention. So 10 other people can say, hey, are you there? Here's my issue, here's my question. And if I'm dedicating a good half hour to this one person that I need to have a, a quality conversation with, I'm for half an hour unresponsive to these people. And they think he's online, but he's not reading my message. He's not responding. That's not nice. He read my message, but he, he or that. me on, on unread. Yeah. He, he, whatever it may be, whatever it may be, right? And I, I find that incredibly frustrating, incredibly unnatural. It, it irks me. It genuinely irks me. And I should, it shouldn't as a monk and spiritual person. I should be above all this. But it irks me because none of it is intentional. It's just byproduct, a byproduct of um, the tools we use, right, to communicate nowadays, which are these social media apps, which are these communication apps. It's not intentional from from their side to disturb me. It's not intentional from my side to ignore them or to be unresponsive because I am being responsive. But there's only so many people that you can be responsive to at a certain quality. And if others can manage more than me, my hat my hat off to them. I'm not saying that, you know, we're all uh, equal in that capacity. Yeah. But I feel like it becomes an expectation in society that because someone can, you should also be able to respond more and talk more. But I don't like it. I like this. This is much better for me. Well, it's not only the style, it's the amount, as it's the volume that you mentioned. Yeah. Like some people just like to talk to 100 people a day. You and I are not one of the... No, we're, we're not. not. You're not among those people. And no. it's just not not cool. It's not cool because you can and you should. And look at those people; they can do it. Uh, again, the problem is with the with the position and the jobs that we do, and the, and somehow where we live and 
how we live, again, the time and the ease of approaching somebody, all of that combined, I think, causes a problem. But yeah, it's the that's the thing. The Our senses are overwhelmed. And it's not just from everything that's around. It's It's even people reaching out to us constantly because, again, it's so available. Yeah. Now we have uh, what? How many three official communication channels in in Bhakti Marga, and some some of those messages end up on all three. So, and I I as a responsible you know citizen, I need to <laughs> acquaint myself with what's going on. Responsible citizen of the movement. Yes, and and it's just it's just getting too much, as you said. But again, it's getting too much for me. But for some, mm, it's for some maybe not. It's not. Yeah, no. right. and I respect it. Yeah. But but I think that's one thing. So that one thing is the availability issue and the over, overwhelming amount of things, right? And that's that's for sure. But I think the other thing about these communication apps is that it um, it facilitates a type of communication that that physically, verbally doesn't happen. So, for example, you know, let's let's put it like this: um, aggressive sort of communication. You, you see on social media apps in the comments, people are really rude. A lot of like cyberbullying is going on, and keyboard and, warriors, yeah, yeah, these keyboard warriors, uh, sort of this pejorative that we use. But but generally speaking, just now, sort of, it is true that people feel less consequence to their words, and it goes in all directions. Yeah, with the I love yous, as much as with the I hate yous, right? So, for example, two people can be chatting, and um, they'll be sending hearts and hugs and and gifts and all these things to each other sort of being extra warm and sweet and things but in real life they wouldn't be like this like if they was, they wouldn't be kissing and hugging each other every every second message in in public and especially you know people who may have some attraction for each other whatever like that kind of thing doesn't happen another example imagine you're you're sitting there and you're sort of feeling a little lonely and you would like some kind of romantic connection or whatever and you just say oh, i can just attempt something i'll just write to someone and say hey you know are you interested or whatever and you may do that with 20 different women in one go like just reach out just see what's available (laughs) you wouldn't do that in real life you can't just walk up to 20 women in front of each other and just start saying propositioning all of them at least it wouldn't happen with the ease and with the lack of consequence that it happens in the digital world definitely not as available yeah and so this happens, I feel like, in, in all directions, and especially in the in the sort of hateful speech direction. And, and I'm obviously a, a big propagator of, of freedom of expression and free speech and whatever else. But I'm not a fan of inconsequential, like of, of speech that doesn't carry consequence, right? That I'm not a fan of. I'm, I'm a fan of people being able to express their opinions freely. But you have to know, opinions carry consequence. You can voice them. No one, I should, you shouldn't be stopped, but you have to bear the consequence. And I think social media and communication apps have st- often stripped the consequence away from words. The, the weight of words has diminished with this. And I find that to be problematic because it means people are less measured about what they say. They're less considerate about what they say, which for me actually results in a dumbing down of the conversations and the narratives in general, because it used to be that for a message to, to sort of travel, You'd either have to have immense funding behind it, political agenda, or quality. Because if someone had a rubbish idea and it didn't have money to sort of pump it into everyone's brains, nobody else will. Nobody's going to repeat that idea. (laughs) Nobody's going to pump it for you and you're just going to die in your silly brain where you thought of the rubbish idea, right? Now, well, free YouTube. I, I can make a video on it, I can make posts on it wherever I want and propagate to the whole world my nonsense idea, right? And so that is is massively amplified by social media. And so I would like to, again, not to sound like a boring old fart where I'm saying, you know, stop all of this. No, think, just be more conscientious. Think before you do things, be considerate, be articulate, be precise in your language, be precise in your thinking, be precise and intentional in what you're doing. Don't be reactive, don't be impulsive, don't be superficial, don't be basic in, in, in that in that respect and that requires um a more self-aware approach to social media so by all means go for it but communication we, we can't be the generation that is responsible for the death of meaningful interactions and meaningful communication because we're sitting here just pumping the world with nonsense 
that is not thought through, that has no consideration for the consequence of these words, because there is consequence to all of this. And the consequence is we become, on average, less profound. And, and that, to me, is a huge problem. The genuine interaction. That's true. That is true. But it's, yeah, it's it goes, I think, both ways. One In one way, we are more reckless in what we put out there, or at least we were. Um, but then, at the same time, you have people going back to 2008, pulling a joke out of context, and then canceling somebody in 2022. Yeah. So, on one hand, you have less consequences. On the other hand, you have more consequences, and everything that's is... a good point. And it's inconsistent. I think that's the thing. It's the consistency of, yeah. of consequences, because the the rules are changing, the... The play field is changing. Everything is changing so rapidly that you that you don't know what's what anymore. And unless you have this firm grounding that we got from Guruji, for example, you're gonna get lost. Mm. I see so much. I mean, I don't need to see the, the data is there. How many people lost? What what's with the depression, the, the addictions? Uh, you know, people don't know what they are. Not even who they are, but like what they are. Like some basic things are being being forgotten, you know. And then, of course, of course, it comes down to knowing that you're not a physical being, that you're not just, you know, a man, a rishi, a whatever, you know. But it's it's beyond that because as long as we attach to anything physical, we were lost. Yeah, and social media again, it's just perpetrating. It's just pushing it even mm, further mm, out there, amplifying. Yeah, yeah, it's a good point you mentioned about cancel culture. I hadn't thought of it because it, it is obviously a very real thing, and and so that would almost counter my point of there seems to be sometimes be intense consequence to what you say. And and you're right, it is a consistency issue because in some cases there isn't, and in other cases there really is. Yeah. But it requires coming out in a with your name and face. Do you not think that's, that's also why we have anonymous <laughs> bashing all over the internet? Yeah, burner accounts, right? That's Everyone it. has their anonymous yeah, burner accounts. Um, but do you not think it's also a question of um, mob mentality? That sometimes people just because mobs are, are a thing; they've always been a thing. It's nothing new. Forget social media again. Like you of know, course. public executions and shaming. Were right, right. People just it. sort of go with the populist movement, and I think I think social media. Are, also amplifies that to some extent, which is, you know, whatever's trending or whatever, you know, most people are doing, it's like, let's just jump on board, right? It's the thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I think that that creates sort of unnatural or, or cultural phenomena, right? And I, I think we, we talked about this sometime before, how culture shifts used to happen over a much longer period of time. Remember you were t telling me something about this and it was like, nowadays, what's fashionable, what's not, or what's, you know, culturally relevant it just shifts like at a crazy, you know, breakneck speed. It's like what was in five years ago is completely irrelevant now. And technology sort of advances these things heavily. Yeah. We, we spoke about this the other day. Yeah. Like I grew up listening to tape cassettes and watching yeah. and then CDs came out and it was like, okay, this thing is changing the world. Within a few years, it was just digital. It was just MP3. Now nobody... IPod. Now nobody has anything saved. Everything is on the Screen, cloud. Everything yeah, is on Spotify, someone else's computer things. somewhere, you know. Yeah, yeah. And and everything else, like like clothing trends, even even the the way that people interact with each other. Like I, I saw data about uh, online dating and so on yeah. lately. It, nobody like interacts physically. And I, I saw where was it? it? Was some guy was doing like an experiment. Who showed me this? This was when I was traveling last year somewhere. Somebody showed me there's one guy who's approaching girls and trying to start a conversation and they were all looking at him and then like, like, why are you talking to me? Because right. like, I don't know who you are. I haven't seen your Instagram or anything like that. <laughs> like I need to do a background check before yeah. I even talk to you. <laughs> Funny, isn't it? Yeah. Actually, th there's one argument I was thinking also leading up to this episode, this podcast. I was thinking, you know, Things used to be, at least it feels to me, and, and tell me if I'm wrong, but things used to be more special back in the day, and it was because they were more rare. So, for example, um, I, I was always a big sports fan, um, variety of sports. Um, and if I had a favorite player, for example, Ronaldo, Brazilian Ronaldo, if I wanted to watch him, I got to show up on Saturday at this exact time, and then I can watch him for 90 minutes. 
And you can't blink. And I my, mean, you had a replay. When you when you are the when you're the game, then you can't blink. Sure. Yeah. And my 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 attention is on it, and I'm sort of engaged and and enjoying much more because I know this is not an experience that I can have whenever I want. So it's more special. Um. Nowadays, with with like for example something on YouTube, I can go and watch in one day every goal of his entire career and and watch every replay and everything, whatever it may be, to the point where I'm just sat like over like i'm just bored it's too much like okay cool it's not impressive anymore like it's just mundane normal it becomes a standard his right. level of game becomes a standard also to him. You're, you're overexposed to these yeah. things and i think the same applies to everything music movies whatever it may be ideas just content it's just content overload right and i and i was thinking how can you sort of get back that feeling of this is special and this is rare and this is whatever it may be and i think you have to create it for yourself because the the you cannot reverse technology, right? No. These, these platforms are here to stay. It oh, is the what world's, it is. The world's going its way, though. right? And I think that's where actually there's a call for much more self discipline and self awareness. Like I can stay clear of these things and consume them more rarely, and so therefore when I do, I'll enjoy it more because it's a more it's a rare experience for me. Not that it's scarcely available, but I make it scarce for myself making each interaction with it more interesting. And this is actually part of Krishna's psychology. I mean, in the in the Gopi Gita section of the Srimad Bhagavatam, the gopis want Krishna all the time. Yeah. They, they express, we want to see you all the time. And Krishna actively hides himself from their vision. He appears and disappears. He appears and disappears. And they complain. They say, why are you torturing us like this? And Krishna and this is the beauty of it we don't have to speculate he openly says it what his agenda is he says by giving you what you want but then also holding it back I am increasing your longing for it and therefore the intensity of love in your hearts and so I feel like sometimes we have to create that for ourselves because we have to be the architects of that experience in a sense because social media the internet everything is just here consume 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 to the point where it becomes you become sort of um numb numb to it yeah. yeah you become numb to it and and so you have to almost say like how do i not lose that fire that taste that experience um and so sort of scale back and then make engagement meaningful like make each thing matter right and i think that's a really cool sort of analysis and way to way to look at it i mean because it it really is I don't want to be a nostalgia merchant where I'm just sitting here just thinking, oh, everything was better back in the day. Because where does that get us? Well, it's always like that. Everybody talks. Every generation says how the previous yeah. generation was better. That's true. So it's never true. Problem yeah. is, problem is, I, I, I that's the hard part. Yeah. Uh, telling yourself actually it's not true because I genuinely believe it was. It's like I, I look at sports in the '90s. I look at movies, music. I'm just like, it's just I prefer it then. It's just better. And then you know, someone from the '80s will say the same. Someone from the '70s will say the same. And you're just like, oh, maybe we're all just wrong yeah but that's why i want to take some lessons from the past and be like maybe we can recreate some of the the frameworks within which we were having those experiences because maybe that's what's changed the content is just as compelling or, or interesting now um but if we just create recreate the the framing of that content which was scarce but meaningful interaction because that's well that's what i've my introspection has led me to to understand that it was it was making things rare makes them sometimes more special. And I, and I actually think philosophically that has a lot to do with the human experience. Sometimes people ask, why did God create all of this? Why are we all here? And I think it's because he created scarcity. We were in him, together with him, however you philosophically conceive of it. And he creates apparent separation from him, the illusion of separation. And in that separation, we perceive scarcity of love, of him, of God scarcity of the divine and in that scarcity we are left thirsty and in every little drop of water that we get wow what an experience what a like i feel relief i feel satisfaction i feel pleasure but that is a manufactured experience that wouldn't be possible unless scarcity had been created first right and so i think sometimes when i talk about social media as as big a leap as it is from sort of existential philosophy to tiktok scarcity is your friend like make these interactions more meaningful make them less often you'll have more time for other things that matter to you but you'll also experience the times that you do go on these things um more that's i think 
an advice I would give maybe to people? I personally, mm, I say there's there's one aspect of social media that that aspect of abundance and availability of everything. I'm partially grateful for it because I'm a person that quickly gets tired of things and having everything available shows me very quickly um, that this world is not what it's about. Right. You know, so in a sense, as, as negative as it, as it is, um, having the ability to see the whole picture and to really, like when you go nowadays to, uh, I was the other day in, uh, in Frankfurt and I was just walking through through the city and I was seeing all these different people doing all these different things and it was like when you're in a village you have only you know you only have a certain a very narrow picture when you're in in, in, a, in a city like that then you have all kinds of different people coming together in one place and you see them all and none of them seem happy like like they're doing all these different things and they have all these different you know shapes and colors and and backgrounds and and inter interests and everything and none of them seems to be having what I want to have for myself. So in the, in the same way in social media, it even expands it even more and it's 24 seven and it's global. You can see everything and you can really see kind of the bigger picture, zoom out and find where is, where is what I want? Is yeah. it in any of those places? And very quickly it's not. Like there are certain things that I would like, like, I don't know, I, I like certain things. As I said before, like there's these certain interests that I like. I like clean, well-made things. I like, you know, competency. You know, that's why I have this uh, yeah, quite a wide range of interests. But like sometimes I'm going to listen to a, a neurologist talking about, you know, how dopamine, for example, works. Since it's your birthday, media. we're going to have to tell everybody. So Jay Gopal is known as the GKK. This means it's he very is the untrue. general knowledge king. Yeah. If you want to know some random stuff, about random stuff, ask Rishi Jagopal. He will tell you facts about things that you go, why on earth do you know that? But he does. This is a fact. I'm also known ask as a, anyone. I'm also known as a person that doesn't like to be asked random things <laughs> <so> randomly. <laughs> Both things can be true at the same time. Yes. Sorry, I interrupted you. Go on. No problem. But this this general knowledge interest like gives me the internet gives me opportunity to know a little bit about everything, yeah, or to nitpick what I like to know, and not to have to commit myself. Because in order to get that level of knowledge, before you would have to study, you would have the only access to those people was that you actually study under them. Either it was way back in the day in a gurukul, or a couple of decades ago at a university or somewhere. Now you have now you have most of those people really available. Yeah, like for example, this this whole. The video production thing, the broadcasting and so on. Ten years ago, it would be, already ten years ago, yeah. it would be barely possible, maybe. Twenty years ago, absolutely impossible. You really need to have inside knowledge that you work somewhere, you had to have a lot of money to like establish all the satellite connections and whatnot to actually broadcast something live. Nowadays, with a much smaller budget, with way less experience and knowledge, we can actually do that same thing because of that availability of that yeah. knowledge. But then again, coming back to like this ultimate point of why I what I want for myself, I can see also a lot of stuff that I don't want, and I can just quickly navigate through that and 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 see that. So in that sense, I actually like seeing that bigger picture. I like seeing things that I don't like, and being and having those things like readily available for me to experience because it reminds me of things that I don't want. I like sometimes getting ads for things that I don't like. Like I get sometimes, um, because I like nice things, I will get some really expensive stuff. You know, I'll get like, I don't know, Louis Vuitton leather bags and stuff. I really don't like that. <laughs> and it makes me good, feel good about it because I don't like that stuff, you right. know? So, okay, some progress has been made. Maybe, you know, some level of detachment, some some kind of taste improvement has been developed in me in this, in these last 15, 20 years since I'm like an adult, um, I, I started late with adult, <laughs> 15 years. <laughs> I was thinking about the spiritual path, but um, 
it's it's also good to see things that you're not attracted to and just leave them there. Yeah, I get you that. know, like yeah. knowing that the world is not the thing. It is what was that saint in Greece? I forgot. What was it Saint Partenius who went he was in love with that with that girl and then he went sailing and he came back and she died in the meantime. And he went and and he took her skull out of her grave and he kept that skull as a reminder for what he was attached to and what caused him pain. It's a not it's nothing. She's not even there. It's not even a person. It's his own projection. It's his own expectation out of someone, out of something that was never there to begin with. Something intense that you, example, but yeah. If it's a very intense example, <laughs> but I love intense examples. Um, and he kept that skull as a reminder, something that he doesn't like, something that is just a negative reminder. Yeah. So in that sense, the world is really readily giving us all these negative examples, stuff that we don't want that we can be reminded of. It's like a scar. People sometimes wear their scars proudly because it's like this is a reminder of what I've been through and it reminds me not to repeat the same mistakes or, or whatever whatever it is. I get it. Makes sense. Um, I, got, I got a final question for you, I think, because I think we've pretty much gone through most of the topics about social media that I wanted to touch upon. So if someone was uh, living in a spiritual sort of context and, and with spiritual aspirations, they wanted to open a social media account on whatever it may be, what would be your sort of recommendation in terms of not not behaviors, because I think we've spoken about that, the psychology and all of this, but just like content, like what would be really truly beneficial content? Because, and I'll, I'll just qualify the question. I often feel there's a lot of fake content. And what I mean by fake content is that what they're saying may be true, but it's just showing a very specific part of who they are. It's a very... Uh, curated representation of who they selective. are or whatever, selective, right? Um, and I think that has some upside and it has some downsides as well. So what would be your point of view on, on if someone was to say, look, I want to use social media for good purposes. What's your viewpoint on that? Like expose everything, expose not everything. What kind of content? How'd you, how would you go about it? Well, I would probably go the way I do it, which is I'm f trying to limit myself to things that are helpful. Like I, and also, as you said, there are certain people out there that give things that are fake. Um, I don't know. The world is a messy place, I guess. Uh, yeah. It's not the easiest thing in the world to do, but... Again, just be selective and observe yourself. I would go back to what you said at the beginning, how we started this with this, uh, with the Bhagavad Gita 262, 263, and just see what you're being attached to. And and like we kind of are here to attain a certain goal, not kind of, we are here to attain a certain goal. We are here to attain this yeah. freedom from the entanglement to uh, transcend this world and to come to our you know ultimate potential, whatever we call it. Um, and the the only thing to change because our soul is such down and it's in eternal bliss it doesn't lack anything it doesn't need anything the only thing that is lacking and that it needs things are and it is experiencing these, this struggling and suffering is our mind and our body obviously so in the same way that we create comfort and for our body and we keep it healthy we can we apply the same principle on our mind if I if I know that if I eat uh, spicy salty food late in the night, I'll not feel good the rest of like the whole next day and maybe even the next day because I'm getting old now, so it impacts me quite a bit. I don't want to do it because yeah. my body doesn't feel good. I don't feel good. So in the same way, if I consume negative content or, or destructive content, let's say, I'll not feel good about myself. That stuff's gonna stay in my mind. It's gonna you know loop. And and it's gonna take me on a on a road that I don't want to be on. So like that, I'm engineering my own mind and what I'm thinking about, how I'm thinking, what I'm doing. Also, even equipping myself to be able to do certain things. Like a lot of skills can be learned online, um, not just like practical skills, but even even soft skills like understanding yourself, understanding other people. Um, like you know, lately I've been sending these psychology psycho tests to to yeah. people around because I, I like that kind of stuff. I like to understand how I behave, how others behave, to sure. to again have this 
experience as good as possible and as as, as conducive to our spiritual progression uh, as possible. Because again, it is ultimately leading you, leading us to to that point. So that's what I would say. I would say whatever you do, just be aware of what it does, what the social media does, what this content does, what we are, how we behave. Yeah. Um, and and find your own path because these blanket umbrella statements do this or do that it's like saying this food is good for you somebody was telling me a couple of months ago i was having a discussion with somebody they told me eat salad why you don't eat salad the salad is good for you and it was like middle winter and salad's not good for me like especially not in midwinter especially if it's like really green and it's not good for me it's gonna kill me so I had to spend 15 minutes explaining to a person how the digestion works and why it's not good for me because they said salad is good. I read it in the newspapers, you know. Got it. So some things are good for somebody, some things are poison for someone else. Everybody needs to figure out by themselves. Yeah. I, I As you were speaking, I just I got reminded of a conversation I had with Babaji Satyanarayan Das in Vrindavan, a um, friend of Guruji's, and, and I have had a few conversations with him and I asked him one time, what do you think is the biggest problem on the spiritual path, the biggest sort of danger? And he said, Pratishta. And he explained Pratishta as being um, fame. So people wanting fame, wanting wanting recognition. Reputation. Reputation, all of this. And so I think when it comes to social media, the the topics that come to my mind is, I think it's a very good thing to, to share what you have received that is beneficial, that is of benefit to the world. Guruji is always encouraged. He says, if you have a beautiful, bright light, you're not going to hide it under your bed. Right? So I, I totally agree with that. And I think, therefore, people, humans, devotees, if you have something of worth, do share it. Right? Absolutely, yeah. But, but check your intentions. Monitor yourself. Don't do it for Pratishta. Like, don't, don't chase the fame. Don't care about the number of likes or the number of views and whatever else. Because the minute you fall into this game, you're in the trap. And you don't know you're in the trap. And then even when you find out you're okay being in that trap, it's it's not it's not doing you any good. And so I would say first make sure that you're not allowing yourself to become fueled and becoming a slave of that chase of pratishta, of reputation and fame, name and glory and all of these things. And secondly, I would say don't contribute to the overwhelming amount of falseness that is there by by being a little vulnerable sometimes. Don't be ashamed, don't be afraid to to, to represent yourself as you truly are. Because if you create these false images of perfection, you're not helping people because you're making people think that is who you are, that is the expectation, that is the norm. And it's not true. Like I, I'm sitting here talking about football references. We're talking about feeling stress and getting told off by Guruji or whatever it may be. And and I've always made it a point, and I think you have too, that when we're giving satsangs and we're sharing with people, be honest, like say things as they actually are as much as is, is helpful to the situation. You don't need to now make a pity party either and start sort of just spewing, spewing negativity everywhere. It's not that, but it's the more authentic you are, the more transparent and honest you are about certain things. Um, always keeping in mind your audience and, and what they're liable to understand or not. Because if you also just say things out of, out of transparency to an audience that cannot understand the context within which you're saying, it's going to, not have its desired effect, but yeah. what I mean is, don't don't portray yourself in a very very curated way. Portray yourself in an intentional way, in an honest way, and with the clean intention of I'm here to spread something that I truly believe, to represent something that I truly believe will be of benefit to anyone that consumes this. I'm not putting it out there to boost my self esteem. I'm not bo- putting it out there to boost my reputation. If you do this, you are you are unfortunately acting against your spiritual interests. You are acting um, as they want you to act, and as the world is is compelling you to act, and you shouldn't do that. It's just, and I'm saying that's not not as a as a sort of father figure saying you shouldn't do that, but it's just you need to to become aware of how coherent you are with your intentions or not. If you intend to be that way, by all means, go ahead. That's the way to do it. Life will teach you yeah. if, if you took the right decision or not. I don't, you know, nobody needs to lecture you on that. But if, uh, and I suspect many of the people that w- would watch a podcast like this do have different intentions for their life, do have different objectives, then, as I said earlier, you've got to be more intentional and more mindful of what it is that you're actively doing. Every, every time you click a like on a post, don't treat it so trivially. Intend to do it. I, I want this person to know I like their content. Because you don't know how people are receiving those things. 
Like I know men, for example. I've spoken to men. A girl likes their their post. They think, oh, she's interested. We're getting married next week. Next week. It's on, right? And it's like, no. <laughs> and so girls, by the way, many men think like that. And vice versa, right? Guys, you like the girl's post? She thinks, you know. And so just everything needs to be more thought through, more intentional, more truthful, more sincere. And um, to avoid the sort of pitfalls of materialism, don't do it for pratishta. I, I agree with 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 Babaji Sati Narendas, it's a very insightful comment and one that I, I have observed myself and Guruji has more than once pointed out to many of us, including myself. Yeah. That's a whole other topic. Yeah. Perception. Yeah. And maybe we can have a conversation about that in the future. Let's see. All right. It's a massive pleasure. Happy Same. birthday. Thank you very much. Getting old. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way around that one. Next year is going to be a big one. We have to do a 40th birthday podcast as well. Oh my God. The big 40. Mm. You'll come in a leather jacket and a bike. <laughs> Midlife crisis. I'll bike my convertible outside. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a car guy, not a bike guy. True, true. Yeah. That is true. That is true. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Jay Gurdiv. Jay Gurdiv.